uh, rolling. I know there's a lot of very exciting people in the audience uh, who are here, and uh, we want to recognize them. And we scheduled this for an hour. I just want to let you know, if we don't get to all the questions by the end of the hour, uh, or all the comments by the end of the hour, uh, my staff will still be here. We'll be able to take some questions. Uh, first of all, I um, I am so honored to introduce Sheriff Salazar, and he has offered to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, and this is that point in time where I try to recognize all the dignitaries and hopefully not leave anybody out. Uh, we have a representative from the office of Jose Menendez. Are you here, Ana Alicia? Oh, thank you. There she is. All right. Uh, we also have with us a former councilman, Ray Lopez, uh, who represents your District 6. Thank you for being here, councilman. We also have with us a representative from Council District 4, uh, from Councilman Santaya's office, uh, Edward Mugia. Thank you for, for being here. And we have the newest official of the night. Um, he's hot, he's exciting. Um, uh, County Commissioner Justin Rodriguez. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you, Councilman uh, Sandoval. She does a great job, and she's been a great partner uh, in my old office as state rep, and I know she will continue to be a great partner in the newest office, which is County Commissioner. I'm very excited and honored. Uh, this feels a little bit like a homecoming to me. I did not go to Jefferson, but our first home, uh, as many of you know, was right down the street here on Meredith uh, back in 2000, 2001. And then from 2002 to 2004, I had the privilege of serving as the Jefferson Neighborhood Association president. I see plenty of familiar faces. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to come by simply to say hello, good evening. Um, I'm excited about the opportunity to continue serving you in uh, county government now as county commissioner. Uh, for those that live in my old house district, which was 125, I know this is, uh, this is TMF territory here, uh, but but uh, for those that live in House District 125, there is a special election coming soon uh, to replace me. Uh, that is February 12th. Uh, I know Councilman Lopez is one of the candidates. Uh, so please make sure you uh, circle that if you live in the district. Um, it is going to be probably a very low turnout uh, affair. Uh, so the more the merrier we can get to, get to come out and vote. Uh, we need to make sure we have representation throughout the session uh, here in Austin since it started this week. Uh, but again, I just wanted to come by. Let me let me have uh, you jot down my numbers just so you know. Uh, 210-335-2612. I'll say it again. 210-335-2612. That's the office number downtown. Uh, my my uh, email is justin.rodriguez at bear, B-E-X-A-R dot org. Uh, please let us know what we can do. We're excited to make... Uh, make some announcements in the coming weeks on uh, how we can be more accessible and transparent at, at uh, Bear County. Uh, I've got my first commissioner's court meeting on Tuesday, so I'm excited about that. But again, um, if there's anything we can do to coordinate, to collaborate, to work with District 7 and the Councilwoman, uh, please let us know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilwoman. <laughs> quick and efficient. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, very much. Uh, so I acknowledge, I think, uh, there are a couple more highlights. Uh, we do have Ms. Doris Griffin with us. She is our appointee to the Joint Commission on Elderly Affairs. Ms. Griffin. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, we also have our appointee to the Bond Oversight Commission is here. And that is uh, Councilwoman Elena Guajardo, right in the back. Thank you. Just so I can 
losing some peripheral vision there. Um, all right, and then before we jump into the program, a uh, last thank you is to my team uh, who helped put this on together. They were on vacation for about a week and a half, two weeks, and um, they thought, you know, they would come back to a relaxed new year and refresh, and I, and I had all that unsupervised time to come up with lots of ideas, and I think I probably scared them the first day they were all back, but among them was we need to have a community conversation around the hiring of the city manager and around public participation. So we're really excited to kick off 2019 this way. Uh, I want them all to raise their hands. Where are you? tremendous job of uh, putting this together. I also want to thank the volunteers who uh, who are an extension of our office uh, over there in the boards at the table. Thank you so much. Um, Taylor, Angela, Ernie, thank you very much. Oh, and then Katie, right? Kelly, I'm sorry, Kate. Kelly from Soul Ross Middle School. Pat Nap Middle School. <laughs> we like yeah, all right. um, Thank you very much, guys. All right, so I imagine many of you are here to hear about the city manager selection process. Um, I believe that it is one of the most important decisions that our council will make this term, possibly the most important decision. Um, the fact that you are here to hear about it, to learn about it, and to share your opinion um, really tells me that our community believes in engaging with local government. And that's what we're going to talk about first <laughs> before we jump into the into the city manager discussion. So um, give me just a few minutes to, to talk about that. So we have these two items, right? Public participation and then the city manager discussion. In terms of public participation, oops, sorry about that. In terms of participation, this is um, uh, this is what I'm going to talk to you about. Number one, what is it? What am I talking about when I say public participation? You're going to hear me say that a lot tonight. Let's make sure that, um, that I'm clear about what I mean with that. Then I'm going to tell you why I believe it's important and what I'm trying to accomplish in my time on council with respect to public participation. Okay. What is public participation? It's everything. It ranges from you when you receive an email from me, someone was just telling me they saw the, the newsletter and they were in it, they were in one of the pictures. Mr. Guzman, where are you? <laughs> that's public participation. Uh, to calling the council office, that's public participation. When you complete a survey online, that's also public participation. Being here, obviously, public participation. But I also want to be clear, public participation there's a range to it. On this end, we have just informing you about something that's happening. When I send you an email, that's one end of public participation. Then you can increase it. If you come to a public meeting, that's a little more involved, right, than reading an email. If I ask you to volunteer to be on a task force or to be part, part of a long-term public participation process. That's here. For instance, right now the city's developing a climate action plan. And I do want to give a, a shout out to Councilman Ray Lopez, who did a lot of work on the environment and things there. So thank you very much. That's part of the reason we're here, developing that plan. And there is, um, there's actually a handout about it on the way in. That's a process that council's eventually going to vote on it. But we had a lot of surveys that went out. We had a lot of community meetings. And we had I think like five different task forces or, or working groups working on it. Dr. Adelita Cantu, who's here with us, is on one of those working groups. Thank you very much. So that's pretty, that's pretty involved, right? And then at the far end of the spectrum of public participation, we have you making the decision. And that's when you go and you vote on the bond, right? That's you make the decision, and the council does what you tell them to do, or when you elect your uh, your representatives to the council. So public part, thank you so much. Charlie, uh, also on the team, as of now, as of today, thank you, Charlie. Um, so that's what we talk about. 
when we, that's what I mean when I say public participation. Sorry. And depending what the topic is, you need a different level, right, of public participation. Things that are very important might need something a little bit more involved. Um, you know, who's going to fill your pothole? What contractor does that? Maybe less involvement. I'm probably not going to send you a survey about which contractor you think should fill your pothole, right? Okay. Now I'm going to tell you why I think that's important. If you're here, my guess is you believe that it's important. Who here thinks that public participation is important in city processes, right? Yeah, you probably wouldn't be here if you... Although Dr. Rodriguez did not raise her hand, but that's all right. Um, so number one, it's important to me because it's a commitment I made to you when I sought this office. I said that you would have a voice in shaping the future of this city, and I take that very seriously. I also believe that you elected me and all my council colleagues, for those of you who, are, who don't live in District 7, it's okay, you're still welcome here. But when you elected us, I believe that you entrusted us with the authority to make some, some decisions, to take some votes. But when I take those votes, I have to do some research, right? I have to read the material, I have to study it, I have to ask some questions to make sure I'm doing right by you. For me, part of that research is checking in with the public. I can't do it for every single vote I take. That would be absolutely impossible. But for instance, for the selection of the city manager, yes, I think it's important that I check in with the public on that. Sorry, I don't know why I'm out of breath. I did not run over here. <laughs> okay. Um, So sorry that I didn't remember what my next speaking point was. All right, there we go. Um, so some people uh, here may think, or in other places may think, public participation, oh, that's just when you hold a public meeting and you check a box. Um, has anyone ever heard someone say that or, or think that that's what someone might think public participation is? Right, I'm here to tell you that is not what I believe, okay? I believe that you, as members of the public, actually bring valuable knowledge. You bring insight. Thank you. You bring insight to the processes, to our decision making. You're the expert in living in this city, right? Because you live here. Uh, you know whether or not the drainage works on your street. You know whether or not there's a dead cat <laughs> on, the, on the street. And whether there isn't enough shade at the park. And that's why, if we hear from you when we make our decisions, I think we can have a better product. So for me, that's really the goal of hearing from the public, is having a better outcome. It is not checking the box for me, okay? I also believe that if we don't hear from the public, that we risk a lot. We risk, A, not getting to the best solution, we risk that our decisions won't stand the test of time, or that we have unintended consequences, right, if we don't hear from all the parties involved. So um, if I had to use a metaphor, I would say that hearing from you is part of the foundation of the building that we're constructing. So we don't have a quality foundation, and I'm sure anybody who lives in this part of San Antonio knows how important it is to have a quality foundation, right? If we don't have a quality foundation, our building is going to shift. We're going to get cracks in the walls, and that's not what we want with our city government, right? Okay, so just to summarize, that's why I think it's important. It's the foundation of our decision-making process. I believe you bring valuable insight, and I believe it's about making our decisions stronger. Right? That's why it's important to me. Um, I also think it's important to clarify who is the public. Um, the public is certainly the residents of District 7, the residents of San Antonio, but it's also people who might be impacted by the decision in some way. They all have a piece of that foundation, okay? All right. Let me just take a breath here. Mr. Halderman, how are you? Happy New Year, and as our principal. Oh, 
I should also mention it looks like we're being recorded. Charlotte <laughs> Island kids from now cast essay, thank you very much for your commitment to public transparency. Okay, so uh, before we move on to our next topic, I just want to tell you what my vision is for public participation with the city of San Antonio. So there's a handout in the back that actually lists some recommendations that I'm putting forward. I, I built these uh, in collaboration with some council members, including uh, Councilman Saldana, whose representative is here today. And they're really a set of improvements to, to implement. And they range from broadcasting our, some of our meetings, so broadcasting our zoning commission meetings or some of our council committee meetings. I'm going to start chairing uh, the public safety committee meeting, and I think it would be important to broadcast that. Um, I will be streaming it on Facebook, so if you're not following me now, you, you still can. Um, and the first of these, oh yeah, this is another very exciting uh, recommendation, is that if you come to a city hall meeting, uh, either just to listen or to testify, I think you shouldn't have to pay for parking. In general, I don't believe in free parking because I think it incentivizes people to drive, blah, 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 blah. But I think we shouldn't have barriers, right, for people to participate in, in local government. Um, okay, and of these recommendations that you have, the first of these that's coming up, it's on a council vote. It's on the agenda for January 17th. It's something called a, a set of uh, principles of public participation. And how long is that, right? Uh, what does that mean? They're also on a handout there. It's really, um, and they're also up here on the easels. If you didn't get a chance to come look at these easels, please, I, I really recommend you do. We took, my staff took some time thinking, how do we, how do we jog people's minds to get them to, to think and, and to get meaningful input from them besides just sitting here, right, and listening to me yammer on. Um, so these principles are, they set the standard, I believe, for how we're going to engage with the public. There are 10 of them. I came, I came, I came up with a few, and uh, city staff helped come up with a few more and refine them. And I wanted to give a shout out to the Government and Public Affairs Department. Um, I believe they're here tonight. Oh, thank you very much, Megan. Um, oh, thank you. So for all the wonderful ideas our council office may have and that you may have and that together we bring forward, it's really the city staff that's going to make it all work. They are stakeholders in this process too. And that's why we need to hear from them as well when we develop these principles. So Megan, thank you very much for your work in helping us carry these out. I'll highlight a couple of them. Uh, one of the principles is that we be transparent, that we be open and clear by communicating the decision-making process to the public. So that's what we're doing today, right? By talking about the city manager hiring process. So I believe that if we adopt these, we will set a new bar for public engagement. And it's really going to be a commitment that you will have from city council that every time we do something with the public, you can hold us to these standards, okay? So um, I'm really interested in hearing your reaction to what I just shared with you. I'm also interested in hearing uh, what you think about these. And uh, whatever that you put on these boards, uh, my team and I will review it and it's going to help us as we go forward. These principles are just the first step, that's on January 17th. As you saw, there's a long list of things we want to accomplish. It's going to take probably a couple of years to do that, um, but it's important that we continually get your feedback as, as we do that. So we have time for a couple of questions before we go into the next item. So if we have any questions, I'll take them, yeah. uh, or comments. Okay, um, Mr. Greg Monseca, um, <laughs> Give me one second, we'll do this one right here. Um, one, one of the questions I want to ask is that for our next uh, city manager, is she just going to be a resident here in, in the city of San Antonio? Um, yes, that's required in the job description. 
So if there are going to be, let's hold the city manager questions for the second part. So thanks. Okay, Mr. Fonseca. That's a, that's a fair comment. I think there were um, the processes that were done for the, sorry, so for, in case you didn't hear, Mr. Fonseca referred to two council votes that were taken last year and didn't feel that public input was heard. Um, I would tell you that I believe we could have done a much better job of the public input process. And um, part of that would mean you know, that we would have held more meetings or provided more information, but then also let the public know, what did we hear? I think it's important for you to know, how many letters did I get in support of Tobacco 21? Or how many letters did I get in support of paid sick leave? Um, because that gives you some, some background for why I voted the way I did. In fact, I would like to have the time. <laughs> to write why I voted each, in which way each time. And if I had enough staff, maybe now that I've got Charlie, we can consider, consider doing that. But I agree with you, Mr. Fonseca. I think those processes left something to be desired. So that's a really good point is, so you're right, with tobacco 20, sorry, with paid sick leave, that was an option that the council had, was allowing that item, because it was, it was, it came forward from, from petition, there were over 100,000 signatures that brought forward this proposal for paid sick leave. So the city council had the option of putting that on the ballot and letting the voters make that decision. And the council decided, decided otherwise, but that was absolutely an option. Are there any other comments, Dr. Kempton? But one of the things as a uh, faculty member, sometimes I think it would be helpful if we started growing civic engagement, public participation from school age on. So I don't know how the city council can be involved in the, ensuring that the public participation happens really, really early in the schools and that it's part of the curriculum. Yeah, again, I don't know what one word would be, but I just want to put that out there. So, so um, I put, or we put, I didn't write these by myself, okay? Inclusive, engage a broad range of stakeholders um, with particular emphasis on those who do not normally take part in city public participation processes. So uh, make every effort to ensure that stakeholder groups do not feel left out of the process. I think. I think this principle may capture that spirit in that. Um, we so I think we're we're writing down the suggestions and Megan Dodge is here also taking uh, making note of it. Um, I think that's. I was just saying I think when we see stakeholders, we think about us. Oh, so maybe something a little more explicit in here. Um, youth, elderly. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for that suggestion, Mr. Soto. Well, that to add that neighborhood associations, okay. home rule become, begins at the neighborhood. Exactly. Did you feel like your home rule begins at the neighborhood association <laughs> level? All right, take that away, future state representative. Um, I, I think that's a good point. Um, we probably want to strike a balance, right, between how explicit we want to be, um, because I think we could list all the stakeholders as an addendum. Um, but, uh, but I, I respect your feedback, Mr. Silva. I think that's a good point. So we're getting close to 7.30, and I'm going to go ahead and transition to the next item, which I think many people are, are here to, to listen to. Um, so first, I, I have, because, I, because you probably get tired of hearing the same person talk at you for an hour, and because we have other experts in-house, I have asked Ms. Liz Provencio, who's uh, right over here, 
who's a District 7 resident and has been on the city attorney team for um, a number of years to help us with the next section. I'll say a few words about her. She is the first assistant city attorney and she's been with the city uh, since 2016. Her day-to-day -day job is making sure the city operates within the law. She keeps us out of trouble. Thank you, Ms. Provincio. And that means she manages a wealth of knowledge of the city organization. She has very graciously agreed to talk with us tonight about the city manager's role and responsibility. She will speak to what is actually in the city charter regarding what the city manager is actually responsible for, for doing by law. And then um, after she wraps that up, I'll come, I'll say a few words, and we'll, we'll start our dialogue. So thank you very much, Ms. Provencio. Thank you, Councilwoman, for that very gracious introduction, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for letting me be a small part of your meeting here tonight. And as the Councilwoman mentioned, I am from the City Attorney's Legal Department, and so we have almost 60 lawyers that work on behalf of you day in and day out to make sure that um, the 12,000 employees and the number of, of contracts and ordinances and other issues get addressed timely and appropriately day in and day out. But today specifically, I'm here to address what our charter has set out for purposes of the role of city manager, to give a backdrop um, to what is an appropriate expertise and candidacy for applicants for this position. And our citizens adopted a council manager form of government. So our charter has in section two set out that we have a council manager form of government. So what that means in day-to-day -day practice is you all, as the citizens and stakeholders of the city, elect your representatives through the council, um, like our councilwoman, and then those representatives select a manager. And the manager is effectively the CEO, the chief executive officer for the city, who administers the policy that is set by council. So council, on a day-in and day-out basis, is focused on the big picture policy objectives that are gonna be going forward. And once they enact those, into ordinances, it then becomes the job of the city manager to execute those on a daily basis and to ensure that those policy objectives are carried out and fulfilled. And so to get granular, what we mean that, you know, they enact local legislation, they set, they adopt the budget, they set the tax rate, and they determine the policy and appoint the manager to execute that policy. So if you think about it, as a, a parallel to a corporation, you all are the shareholders that elect the board of directors, which is effectively our council, who then, like a board of directors, appoints a CEO to carry that operation out day in and day out. And so with our city manager specifically, the charter reflects uh, an enumeration of duties that that person is afforded, and so they're required to enforce all laws and ordinances that are passed by the council. Um, for us here in San Antonio, they supervise 12,000 employees. So your city government is comprised of 12,000 employees, which amounts to 40 different departments approximately. And so with that, the city manager exercises the administrative oversight of all of those departments to ensure that the things that need to be done on a day in and day out basis are effectively carried out. And that's everything from public safety with your fire and police departments that report to her, to our uh, capital improvements, to our government affairs. Um, so all of those departments fall within her lane to get things done day in and day out with a council setting the policy direction that effectively sets the goals for that day in and day out activity. So of course, as that chief administrator 
um, the manager will advise counsel and give input on the topics that they are interested in. So the example that the councilwoman walked through tonight is about public participation. And so her policy objective, obviously, is to strengthen that, enhance that, make that much more robust and meaningful. And so we're tasked, as city staff then, to help support that initiative, help generate the ideas, find those options to be able to provide to her so that she and her colleagues can then determine the course of policy that's going to govern effectively how we operate day in and day out. And so that's an example of, of how it comes to fruition. And just to give you some, some examples of how it effectively plays out in addition, um, so you know that we, in our budget process, we have, um, through council direction, have adopted the equity um, evaluation through budget priorities. Prior to that, it was all proportionate. In other words, all council districts receive the same amount of money um, out of the budget. And so by policy direction and council's um, vote and approval, effectively we now operate under an equity policy. So we look at what has been historically ignored over the years in San Antonio to determine how we then meet those needs, which may effectively mean that council um, budget money is not going to be um, the same amount in all council districts. If we have historically underserved areas, then of course those needs should rise to the top as part of the equity analysis that goes into the budget process. So similarly, council set direction on street maintenance being a priority, and as a result, more budget dollars were allocated to that. And then over the course of this last year, as well as affordable housing. And so with those policy initiatives being the direction that they have set for us, then it's incumbent upon us as staff then to make that happen on a day in and day out basis to make all of that come to fruition. And so I hope that gives a little bit of context for the type of expertise that's required for a manager who, again, must sort of oversee and ensure that there's experts in place for 40 different departments that ensure that the work gets done efficiently, promptly, and expertly on a day-in and day-out basis to serve your needs, to serve your priorities as enunciated by the policy set by your representatives, um, and in this case, um, Councilwoman Sandoval. Thank you. Thank you. Far away because I imagine uh, we'll have a variety of questions that will come up uh, that will uh, that will share in responding to you. Um, so I want to give you just a couple of my thoughts. Uh, I think I owe you that as constituents regarding what I am going to be looking for in the city manager hiring process. And all city staff is here. You have to leave the room right now. No, just kidding. Can you hear me okay? Because nobody laughed. <laughs> um, number one, I think the individual who comes forward, except for this guy in the front row who I've never met before, thank you for laughing so well and so heartily at, every, at everything I'm trying to be funny with. So thank you. Who are you? <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm new in town. Well, I grew up here, but I'm back in Silicon Valley now. Oh, welcome back. Welcome back. Yes. Um, okay. All right. Um, We'll talk about you later, after, after 8 o'clock, but, okay, so, in, this is what I'll be looking for in this individual. I think there are going to be three key constituencies that this person has to work with, and one is the community, and by community I mean you, the residents of, of San Antonio, whether you just came back from Silicon Valley, whether you grew up here, you've lived here your whole life, the community. I believe they have to work with the council, right? Because the council is ultimately going to be the boss of, of this individual, the, the managing body of them. And I believe they have to work well with the staff as well, right? They have to be able to be an effective boss. So what I'm looking for is the skill set 
that indicates you can do those three. They will be able to do those three things. How am I going to look for that? The first thing that I'm going to look for is absolutely technical competencies. The cities and organization, like um, Ms. Provencio described, with over 12,000 employees, the budget is over $2 billion. This isn't the minor leagues. We are the seventh largest city in America, and whoever comes forward has got to be able to have the technical abilities to manage an organization that big. Um, and, to, and to manage it deftly you know, um, with expertise, not struggling with some of the basic things like making sure we continue having, you know, garbage service. Um, so that's what I'll be looking for on the one hand. Now, we may be the policy body on council, um, but we can't scrutinize every single little thing, right? With 12,000 employees, over 40 departments, we can't. So I also want to really know where do the passions of this person lie? Where do their convictions lie when it comes to being a public servant because I believe that if I have a certain policy direction and if you're more or less aligned with me, you might do a better job implementing it because it's something that you that you would want to see implemented. Now granted, whoever gets hired or even Miss Scully today, right, she may not agree or I may not agree 100% with, with um, her ideas and she may not agree 100% with mine but she knows that it is her job to implement them, and she will take direction from the council to do it. Um, but I still, I still want to know where that person lies, right, on that. So, um, in particular, the issues that are going to be of importance to me are transparency and public participation. Where does this person lie on, on that? What ideas will they bring forward in terms of making government more accessible? Um, customer service, what ideas will they bring forward in terms of um, improving customer service, and dealing with some of the biggest challenges that San Antonio has today. I also want to know what they think are the biggest challenges. Maybe they, ha they can identify something I haven't, but for instance, I think some of our generational poverty is one of the biggest issues that we have today. How, what role is there for the city to play in that? What tools can they bring to the table to help us address that? Um, the rising cost of housing and property taxes, the burden that, that we experience, what ideas can they bring to the table with respect to that? These are a couple of the things I'm looking for, but I also want to know what's important to you in the management of the city. If you took the time to come to this meeting and to give us your input, you may have a couple of ideas. Um, I would like to keep the discussion focused on the management of the city, because ultimately this is what the city manager does. She, will, she or he, right, we don't know, she or he will also be in the public. I, I expect them to be out there to be listening. I expect them to be out there to be explaining processes. I don't expect them to be giving, you know, policy direction out there, but I also want to know how they're going to engage with the community. How will they do in this setting? How will they do with ad possibly adversarial organizations? You know, the city's been sued not just by people who trip and fall in our parking lots, but also by organizations, by community-based organizations. I would like to see us have a better relationship with those groups. So that's why for me it will be important to see the candidate or final candidates interact with some community organizations and in the public. How many of you have, uh, have had to take a test when you, when you had a job interview? Anybody here? Oh, the rest of you had it easy. All right. Or you made your own job, right, because you're your own boss, right, Dre? Um, it's the same thing, right? I want to see how that person performs. Uh, carrying out some of the duties that they will have to carry out as city manager. And that's why I think it's important to see how that person performs in public, in a community setting, because that's going to inform my decision. So, it's kind of all over the place, but those are my, edit that out, don't make that um, Those are some of my thoughts on the selection process that I will be going through uh, with my colleagues. Again, I'm not the only person making this decision. There, there will be um, 
nine other council members, and of course the mayor making this decision. The timeline for the hiring process is in a handout. Um, starting tomorrow, the council will sit down in a special meeting and review the resumes. We'll decide who comes back for an interview. Those interviews will take place um, starting the week of January 11th. I anticipate we're going to have, the schedule says we're going to have a couple of rounds of interviews. And the idea, the goal, is to make our decision by the end of the month. Um, I think that would be great. I, um, I would not like to see a long disruption in services, so I think it's important to, to move deliberately. Um, but I also think it's important to stop and listen, right? That's, that's one of the things that we do with public participation. It's not free. It takes time. It takes money. Um, but I, I absolutely believe it's worth it in, in this case. So those are really, that's really all I have to say. I think at this point, uh, Bianca will come up and uh, take notes up here. And we're, he we're here to listen to your comments. Uh, and if you have any questions on the mechanics of this process, um, Liz and I are, are here to, to respond to those. So thank you. Well, thanks for coming, guys. There's a lot of cookies left. <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, I would like to stress that in the, these are very good principles, but one of the important ones that is left out is having government be honest and ethical and to hold government accountable. Uh, that, to me, is so important. That's why I serve on the mayor's uh, charter review board on ethics reform. And in looking at for a city manager, that to me is critical that she really understands the importance of ethics in government. And uh, otherwise, there will be no trust in government. Thank you very much, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, Ms. Grace Rose. Hi. Um, I, I just have a question on District 2. Will they be participating in all the interviews coming up and, and all that? So, um, very good question. That was probably the second most important decision, if not one of the most important decisions that this council took uh, today. We, so the question was, will District 2, the new appointee uh, representing uh, District 2 of San Antonio be participating in this decision? Yes, they will be. Um, Today we appointed a new person, but they did not start working today. They will start working 10 days from today. Uh, so they will come in after the finalists for interviews have been selected at that point. But they will still be part of the interview process. So if you look at the timeline, they come in just in time for the interviews, but they won't be able to say, interview this person. Does that make sense? It's a little odd. Yes. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I did, and I was incorrect. I apologize. Um, the interviews will be held January sixteenth. That's a, is that a Monday? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the district two representative will vote on this. They will come in 10 days from today. Some of the interviews will have already taken place at that time. Is, I mean, is, there, I mean, this is there a reason not to like um, hold off until start the process so that they can be part of it completely? I think it's unfortunate. I mean, that's a whole district. And I wouldn't want that to be on my district that, you know, my representative wasn't part of it until... The, the vote. I mean, it's sort of after the fact. I, I think that's a really, really good question. It would take a majority of the council to, to change the, the timeline. The timeline that the council came to an agreement on it, came to consensus on it uh, in late November and early December. So, so let me tell you what I think can happen. What, one way that we can make sure District 2 is part of the process. We do know that the representative will vote on the final selection. Um, 
the District 2 council person has access to every single council person who is there. Um, this, happened, this happened to me. Uh, I was elected on May 6th. I did not take office until June 1st. And there were some decisions that were making, that were being made between May 6th and June 1st that were going to affect District 7 in the future, right? So I was able to speak to the council members and tell them what my preference was. And they weighed that in when they took the vote. It is informal, right? It does not go on the record. Um, but it does allow for input from the District 2 representative. So they, they will have access, Councilman Artall will have access to all the applications and will be able to review them and will be able to be present in all the public meetings, right? He just won't sit at the dais, but he will be present and hear the dialogue and he can, he can give us his, his comments. He just will not. This is actually a better question for the attorney. <laughs> Grace, does that does that answer the question? Um, yes, but, I, but when you all decided on this schedule, was it prior to Cruz um, giving his yeah. resignation? It was. Uh, Councilman Shaw gave his uh, notice to resign. Um, I believe the last council meeting of the year, right? When Liz and Liz I, I don't. I don't know. It was. Yeah, yeah it was after this. It was after this. I, it, my just last comment is, I would hope that you all would. Consider the fact that you know they they should sit at the, what's ten days when it's such a big um, decision uh, for us in terms of a city manager and then I feel that those people should have the right to be at the table. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a question where you talked about Proposition B and it talked about a super majority. And, and what could that be with our makeup of students? I'm going to hand this one over to you. Okay. <laughs> it'll be nine. It would have to be nine. nine. Yeah, it'll be nine. It'll be nine. And so we'll have the, we have D2 in place, so we'll have the full council that will be participating. So not just the simple majority. It would have to be nine. It would have to be nine. Mr. Fonseca. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, well, I'm just uh, comment. I think the selection of the city manager would have been better served to the city citizens of San Antonio if it would have happened after the May election for city council. Then when he starts fresh with all those new councils, because he's going to start now, some might be gone, and uh, and that way after the election, they, everybody's brand new, brand new board, and, and everything. I think that would have been a better time frame and. And to serve uh, what Grace mentioned would have probably been better off to get representation from District Two. So that's that's my opinion on, on the on the selection process and timing. So. Thank you very much for, for that comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Vincent. Okay. Well, I did not expect that we would run out of questions. Oh, <laughs> yes, people in the back. Could you please tell us your name? Mr. Scully worked for the county, not for the city, but to your point, we do have very stringent ethical uh, rules 
that prohibit anybody with family to be able to benefit from uh, contracts with the city, and we have a prohibition on um, family working for each other, um, spouses within the same chain of command. So we have very stringent ethical rules that govern to ensure that you know, those considerations aren't a risk. Yes, sir. Which is why public information is a very important part of the whole spectrum of public participation, right? The guy from Silicon Valley is laughing. Thank you. Um, exactly. Just being able to communicate critical information goes a big way in, in building public trust. So, thank you. Um, yes. Well, the person there had already said, mentioned it, that are you going to try and hire somebody locally? because this was brought up from outside. An outsider, she brought in the outsider police chief, and I understand that her husband's position was made up just for him. And he was at a starting salary of over 90,000 or 100,000 at the time. They never had mentioned anything about him. But she, but she brought him up, and, and they had to make a new position for him. Okay, so the, um, again, a position at the county, perhaps. I don't know the history of how that position uh, came, came to be. Um, so the question is, are we going to consider hiring someone who lives already in San Antonio or is from San Antonio, or what if they left and came back? I don't know, is that a consideration, too? Um, versus someone who, who is from outside of San Antonio. Um, the job was open to both. We had we had 31 applicants. 12 of them met the minimum qualifications. Six of those individuals work in the city of San Antonio right now. Six of them uh, do not work in the city of San Antonio right now. And uh, I may need uh, staff to back me up on this, but of the six who do not work in the city of San Antonio right now, are all of them from another city? We have one. We have one who, if not two, who worked for the city at one time. I think of the 12, it was only one. Oh, okay. But he's in Dallas now, I believe, or Arlington. Um, so you're asking if that's something I'm going to be looking for as, as a requisite. I think, I think it would be ideal if we could give the job to somebody who's already a member of our community because it's one of the best jobs in San Antonio. Right, and I would want to see someone from San Antonio succeed and have the opportunity to have that job. That said, I'm not going to sacrifice the quality of services that you're going to get just for that. Now, granted, I actually have seen the applications, and I think I think they are all tremendous applicants, and that they could all do a very good job. Um, but I think you're also speaking to, is this person going to bring the values that we have, right? Is this person really going to understand how to work with our community? Uh, and I think that's very important as well. And I will be looking for someone who can do that. So, thank you. I think there was another question in the, in the back. So that, say, 18 months from now, he or she isn't, something's going hinky. Is there a mechanism in place for, for that person to be replaced? What does that look like? Does the citizen have a voice in that? Who's responsible for that? Is it council? Is it a special <laughs> committee? Who, um, who evaluates them, et cetera? Right, so they will be, he or she will be evaluated by the council. They do report to us. Um, it will depend on how we draft that contract. Okay. That's in their probationary period. It will depend on, yes, and th that's a great question. Um, so, so just in case you guys didn't hear, the question is, hey, if things aren't going so great and we want to kind of pull the plug on this, what, uh, what mechanism is there for, for doing that? Yes? Right, right, right. So that, that continual evaluation so that that person is the best employee that they're able to be 
everything's copacetic and stuff like that. You know, I think you're bringing up a really great point. I have been so focused on making sure that we get the right person for the job that I have not started to think about, and so I'm glad you bring this up, what are those terms of employment going to look like? Because let me tell you, Miss Scully has one contract. I don't want to emulate that same contract. It doesn't give the city uh, a I would make sure that your council has the authority to do what they need to do. Um, so we will, we will, uh, <laughs> applause, applause, applause. Um, we will make sure, um, I will work to, to put some provisions like that in, in that contract. Thank you. All right. But, but again, I don't want to say like, oh, we can fire you after two months, right? Like, we want to make sure they're going to stick around for a little while and, and give them some security so that they can do the job. So there's going to be a balance there. But absolutely, the council has to be able to evaluate that person and make sure they're doing a good job and have some recourse if they don't feel that they're doing a, a good job. All right. How much of the information about these candidates can the public have access to through this process? Are we just going to get the finalists and, hey, they're the CEO or the some portion of their resume? Um, I would be willing to uh, to share as much as is possible with uh, with privacy laws. So if the attorney could speak to, to that. Um, I understand all of the, the candidates' names right now are, are posted on the website with where they came from, and I think there's one other piece of information. Um, Correct. And so my understanding, we do have record request information for that, but my understanding is just a matter of making that timeline and understand when it's all going to be released. So, so Ms. Provencio, when do you think we'll have an answer on how, when that can be released? I would suspect it's part of tomorrow's discussion and part of what can be determined at that point um, with the process starting tomorrow. And it's a matter of ensuring that everything is redacted that needs to be redacted and so that it's, uh, you know, appropriate. So again, whatever I'm able to share, if they tell me, Anna, it's okay to share this, I'm happy to give you a call, uh, share it with you. Um, and if they tell me, Anna, don't do it by email because then, you know, blah, 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 or whatever. I, I will follow what, what is ethical and appropriate, but uh, I, I'm happy to share as much as, as is uh, comfortable. So. Um, oh gosh, we're uh, running out of time. Um, and let me just see if there's any more because I know I took a question from you. Is there anyone who has not asked a question who has a question? And if not, I'm happy to go to Dr. Rodriguez. Well, I, I have a comment. Oh yes, I, that I would like to. Who is also an appointee uh, to the uh, Urban Education Board? Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank uh, you. In terms of evaluation, I think that's critical. But we also need the feedback once that evaluation occurs. So that would just be an, another step in the process. Thank you very much for that comment. Letting the public know what the, uh, what, how the evaluation turned out. Excellent point. She's also a board member of Oh, and a board member for, for transparency. <laughs> okay, I will take the last question just because I promised my staff that we would wrap up at 8 o'clock. Um, where is it? Oh, hey, good to see you. Happy New Year. Real quick, sure. gosh, I seem like I learned something here. The salary now is up to 312000 almost getting into a reasonable range. I'm curious because during all the Proposition B time frame, it was like mid 200s or, or thereabouts. Did, did somebody, was that just propaganda, maybe not right information? Or is that the lowest I get pay rates as a possibility? So the prop uh, Proposition B, are you talking about the language that was actually on the proposition? I'm really wondering. I'm thinking the more likely answer is that the lowest paid person got a pay raise, and so now the time jam is going to be a higher amount. Um, it's just different from the Proposition B. I don't know. The, the language of the proposition read 10 times, right, the lowest employee. Well, and people I, talked about it, it was mm -hmm. in the 200s. Yeah, um, Liz, do you know how that was around? I don't know how that number was determined, sir. I don't know what people were saying as part of this. Whenever we were asked, the information we showed was that as of January 1, with the, because there's, um, they pass a, a COLA increase for employees, and so it was always calculated whenever we got asked the question based on the lowest paid employee as of January 1. So that is how, what that calculation is what we always use. Right, rumors abound sometimes, right? Um, well,
Well, I want to thank everybody for, for your time, uh, for your very thoughtful questions and very helpful input in this process. Uh, I, I, def I definitely have stuff to, to take back and share with my colleagues. Um, if you do not live in District 7, I encourage you to reach out to your council member. Let them know what your input is as well. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll